I would tell you a little bit um, now about, in the next hour and a half, about the use of the human metabolic model for systems medicine. So I'm um, from the University of Luxembourg. I'm located at the Luxembourg Center for Systems Medicine. And uh, my res well, the Luxembourg Center for Systems Medicine is very interested in combining experimental tools and computational tools to further understand Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's disease and neurogenerative diseases are on the emphasis of the center. And the speciality of my group is basically the metabolic modeling of human and that we are trying to apply actually these modeling techniques that I will introduce to you now to uh, systems medicine. Uh, my group is called Molecular Systems Physiology Group just because we would like to look at the human in as a system rather than as individual organs or individual cells and we're working towards that. As such, we are interested in studying the diet host microbiota interactions. So what does uh, microbiota, which role does the microbiota plays in terms of human health and how does um, the diet influences us? The composition of the microbiota as well as the health states of the host. And um, everybody of us knows that the diet or nutrition affects health. Um, you know probably that the um, gut microbiota composition is largely affected by what you eat. The drug efficacy is affected by the microbiota in addition to your own um, host system. And of course, um, the response of dietary components is individualized. So my body responds differently or harvests energy differently from given food than any of yours. Um, your body. So this is all known. The question rather is how does that happen? What are the molecular mechanisms underlying these um, different categories? And so we believe that like many others um, computational modeling can actually help to understand further these links between a diet and health and in particular also what drives the gut microbiota and then try to design in silico at least um, prevention and therapeutic strategies so that you can actually maybe manipulate the gut microbiota to be healthier or more suited for yourself or that you actually design diets that would be more suited to your body and to your health status than um, just arbitrary uh, dietary recommendations from the um, magazines. And of course, we can then provide mechanistic explanations that require further um, experimental validation. So what is the modeling technique that we're using? The modeling technique that we're using and um, most of our work is based on is called um, constraint-based reconstruction and analysis method. It's, um, as you will see, a fairly simple mathematical um, method or computational modeling and mathematical methods. If you compare it to uh, kinetic modeling and some other of the more comprehensive modeling techniques. So this COBA approach has been pioneered over the last 20 years um, for microbes. It has been developed originally in the early 90s where we developed um, well, not we, excluding me, um, metabolic reconstructions for diverse organisms, kind of cataloging what is known about the biochemistry occurring in a particular organism, using then simple mathematics, as I will show you, to investigate the properties of those um, microbial networks, and then trying to a lot engineer those organisms. So a lot of these methods that you will see and that we now try to apply to the question of the diet, gut, health access, or also for systems biomedicine, have been developed for metabolic engineering. have been at least numerous um, proof of concept studies that indeed the computational methods help to accelerate the um, experimental design and the implementation of uh, novel strat um, strengths and strategies. So let me see. Um, so the basis of the reconstruction process has been described in a four-step workflow 
where you go from the genome sequence and really the genome sequence and genome annotation is instrumental to this method and you identify in this um, sequence all biochemical enzymes or gene products that you can find based on EC number, name matching, etc. And uh, you match that together with a biochemistry database such as CAC, Brenda, the numerous out there to generate what we call a draft reconstruction. I will show you in the next slide how such a draft reconstruction is look like. But in principle, it's nothing else than a list of biochemical reactions known to be encoded by the genome of this particular organism that you're reconstructing. Afterwards, there's a manual curation needed. You know yourself that genome annotations are incomplete and incorrect in parts. For example, take um, the well-studied uh, microbe Escherichia coli has about 25% of hypothetical um, proteins and another 25% um, of proteins with uh, vague annotations. So even in well-studied organisms, we don't know what all these genes are doing. However, um, for many organisms, model organisms, there are a vast amount of information available, biochemical information, um, physiological data, phenotypic data, etc., or that can be readily generated. So you can use those um, data to further curate your network and to get actually more comprehensive, accurate representation of what could be happening in your organism in terms of metabolism. You then convert this into a mathematical model, and this is a very fast step that can be done automatically by just taking the um, reaction list that you uh, generated and um, create something what we call um, a stoichiometric matrix. And again, this will make more sense in one more slide. Once we have done that, we actually iteratively validate and improve the models that we generated to the representation, biochemical representation of the organism using experimental data, trying to identify further gaps and misannotations in the network until after a few iterations you would um, design or decide to version your model and thereby um, have a starting point for design, discovery and other applications. So here is again a slide showing this uh, reconstruction concept um, for the glycolysis actually. So here you have the first reaction of the glycolysis as you would find it in a biochemistry back textbook. Okay. So you have glucose plus um, energy goes to glucose 6 phosphate, ADP and proton and you have a particular gene encoded. And so you can write down like this O10 or 11 steps of the glycolysis and listing basically what um, reactions, biochemical reactions, um, take place in, in this case, it's actually E. coli in the organism. So um, I should have actually asked you, um, how much of you have biochemistry background versus computer science or bioinformatics, bio biochemistry? Hmm? Purely, okay. Who else is biochemistry? Okay, biology in general. Okay, we get a little bit. So you had biochemistry as well. And then computer science? Purely, all right. <laughs> Three. And the rest? Okay, so for the, I personally think the mathematics behind is quite easy. So, but feel free for the purely and mixed biochemistry ask me questions along the way and for the non-biochemistry oriented people I know that sounds a little strange but also ask me questions if these terms make no sense okay so okay so you can get from a um, textbook or from a biochemistry database you can get um, these reactions the genome annotation you would um, obtain for E. coli from some annotation database and you can match the corresponding um, biochemical reactions. Now, this is basically what we had in the step beforehand, our what I would call curated reconstruction if we had additional evidence for each of these reactions. The next step is to convert that into uh, the mathematical format. So this is what we call a stoichiometric matrix. It is one of the terms that I will use uh, quite frequently throughout the talk. And this matrix is nothing else than a mathematical representation of the same information, in fact, 
this column here. If you look at this, all the columns in this matrix are the reactions and all the rows are the metabolites. And every single time that there is a metabolite appearing in a reaction, you have a non-zero entry. If it does not take um, part in a reaction, you actually have a zero entry. Okay. By definition, we just um, by definition everything which is on the left-hand side, that's that is substrate side, um, is negative as an entry, and everything that's on the right-hand side or product side, it's a positive entry. Okay. And so we can build up very easily um, using um, some easy lines of code um, from this um, table here, such a matrix. Okay. You can see in this particular case that it's in all cases um, one or minus one because the stoichiometric factors of each of these metabolites in the reactions as they take place are one. But you could have also two or higher numbers if the biochemical reactions require so. So this is what we will be modeling. In the first instance, this a matrix describes what's called a hypergraph. So it's a network and it's a graph underlying a hypergraph only because multiple nodes come together um, um, to form a reaction instead of one node, one or one node, one link relationship. Um, we collect at the same time the information about the genes, the enzymes, and then this is a reactions here. Um, so that's the same enolase reaction as you had been shown here and the pyruvate kinase reaction that is here. In addition, we collect for each of these um, enzyme or enzymatic reactions if there's known to be one single gene to be responsible for um, or gene product um, that catalyzes the reaction or if there are isozymes as shown in this case. So either this gene product or this gene product each is sufficient to carry out the pyruvate kinase reaction or in this particular case you have actually protein complex coming together forming a protein and then you have an OR statement. So you can actually um, formulate complex um, gene protein reaction relationships with that. Why is that important? I will show you later on that we can actually simulate single gene deletions or multiple gene deletions using our models and having the information available if there are isozymes or protein complexes associated will help us to eliminate the corresponding reactions. Um, accordingly also, even though not shown here, one protein can of course carry out many different um, biochemical reactions if it has been reported to do so. And finally, one can have a map um, representation of the same information. So this table here and the matrix together with these three protein reaction associations, they represent all the same information. The um, process of reconstructing those um, metabolic reconstructions is well established. There are about, um, well, there are more than 150 uh, microbiome reconstructions that have been done um, following um, the protocol that we published a few years ago. Um, so for 150 or so organisms, you now have um, more or less good uh, reconstructions of the metabolism available. And it basically paraphrases the same um, picture that I showed you, or the pa um, same slide as I showed you at the beginning. The just in terms of time, so traditionally uh, the draft reconstruction is a very quick step. You get your genome annotation, you pass your genome annotation, you get your reaction database, you match them, you get your draft reconstruction. To do the refinement of those reconstructions, to really make sure that the annotations are correct and that your content is consistent with what is known about your target organism, takes time. So normally, why this is maybe a day or a few days of work, this used to be six, 12 months, depending on how much information is available for the organism of work, where you really go through the literature. So, And uh, this is a fast step, just the conversion of the reaction list into matrix format. And then the evaluation, again, on validation, is again a time-consuming step because you need experimental data for that. Now. You can imagine, this is probably a 12-month project for a PhD student or so, that if you wanted to um, generate comprehensive metabolic networks for organism, any organism, 
that would take a lot of PhD students and probably not too happy ones. In addition, the information isn't available for all the microbes or even cell types. So that people, so the biochemical information, many of the microbes, for example, in our gut are not cultured, hence there are no phenotypic or biochemical data available. Hence the field has been interested in developing tools to accelerate that pro um, process. And now there are um, numerous tools available and I may have a slide later on that lists them um, that permit you at least for microbes to generate semi-curated um, draft reconstructions, which at least went through a few of those rounds um, within a matter of a few days, maybe a few hours, depending on the data available and the algorithms they use. After that phase of the field, interestingly enough, now the field is realizing that the automation methods aren't as good as we had hoped for. So we need more data and we do actually require some of the manual curation that's been done at that stage. And those manual curation really went on the level of um, evaluating the topology. So it's really everything that's been predicted or assumed to be there in the network or the biochemical transformation really occurring in the organism and also um, are the pr um, predicted phenotypic characteristics in the computer matching with um, what's known about the organism. And so one of the standard things we do is, if available, we compare our predictions in silico predictions of single gene deletions with available experimental data. So that is a nice way of checking, at least for the growth phenotype, can my model, let it be E. coli again, in the computer reproduce the same known knockout phenotypes as um, observed um, in vitro. Similarly, you could use biolog data where you test different um, carbon sources, nitrogen sources, and you um, query your model in the same way. And f as a reconstructor and modeler, for me, it's most interestingly interesting where the model fails. Because where the model fails, this is an indication where either the knowledge is wrong something is missing or an annotation is incorrect. And so we can use algorithms then again to um, identify those incorrect or missing information and then create hypotheses that then again can be tested experimentally and thereby drive knowledge development. Others um, criteria are actually the uh, production of bio, um, biomass precursors. So that are uh, metabolites supposed to be generated um, by a cell such that you can actually divide the cell. So that is amino acids for the proteins, the nucleotide triphosphates for the um, RNAs, etc. And so you test your model if it can actually produce all these precursors. So these are tests that are done routinely on these models and basically give you also a feel of how accurate and non-accurate um, your reconstruction and model is. Okay, um, so this is what I mentioned beforehand. There's uh, numerous reconstructions available for um, single cell metabolism, but the same method has been also applied for other biochemical networks, such as signaling, um, transcription regulation, micromolecular synthesis, and multicell models. So it is um, what this um, slide is trying to show you, in addition, beside the numbers, is that this is actually a very scalable approach. And I have a similar slide in a second again. So compared to other me modeling methods, this modeling method permits you to go very fast, uh, very large. So uh, the largest network that is shown here is about 80,000 reactions or so. So the matrix is 80,000 columns that you try to solve for and um, about 60,000 rows. So it's a very large um, network that you can solve for describing what's happening in E. coli, in e. coli cell in a very comprehensive manner. And the reason why we can go so large and even larger is because we use um, the most important assumption, which is a steady state assumption. So we assume the system to be in a steady state meaning that concentration isn't changing over time, and that permits you to use um, very simple mathematical met methods, or fast mathematical methods, maybe, rather. 
um, if you think about um, let me see let me see um, I explain you the method in a second let me show you the principle first so once we have um, generated our metabolic network for let's let it be E. coli um, based on our genomic data, the biochemistry data available, experimental data, we have a network available that describes the topology of the metabolic reactions in E. coli. So it's kind of like the map here shown for the LA area. So kind of here you have the intersections, which would be for us the metabolites, and then you have the roads that are the biochemical reactions. Basically, the um, glycolysis network that I showed you at the beginning is not uh, does not is not describing anything else on such a topological network. It is showing you how you can go from let's say down here in um, Laguna up to Malibu or so um, using the different roadways available. Similarly, it can describe you how you can get from glyc um, glucose along the glycolysis to pyruvate the endpoint of the glycolysis. So it gives you the possible roads and routes through the network. And in fact, there are many methods out there that look at to um, network topology, that is um, different criteria, what is the shortest path through a network, a biologic a network, what is the uh, um, centrality, where are the hubs, etc. The difference here in these models is that we actually can also by doing the conversion into the mathematical model, analyze the functional states of the network. So this is showing you uh, the similar or the same road network um, as beforehand, but at different time points in the morning. And you can see how the traffic is changing along the map. So this is how the network is utilized. Okay, The map I showed you at the beginning is a static map, just telling you, okay, there are these possibilities to go from A to B. Having information like, in this t um, case, time available will permit you to elucidate where are the bottlenecks, where are the traffic jams, and how long will you actually take from going from Laguna to Malibu if you were to go through the network. And where are um, possible, let me see, um, possible ways to get around it. So you see here, for example, in the morning you have uh, bottlenecks down here, so you probably would not go along this way. Um, so you would um, maybe be faster to take an alternative route. Similarly, you can think about sorry, a metabolic network. So this is again E. coli. I'm showing you here the lower part of the glycolysis, here the, um, the TCA cycle, and you have some um, byproducts that are secreted here, and up here is uh, oxidative phosphorylation not completely shown. So that's your metabolic core metabolic network for Escherichia coli. And so the question could be here, well, given this wiring diagram, um, if I had 10 units of glucose coming in to this wiring diagram under normoxic conditions, how would, which possible ways are there to um, go through this network? Okay, which functional states can I take on given glucose and oxygen being provided? And I can also ask the question, well, what happens if I don't have glucose available, but, uh, sorry, if I have glucose available but no oxygen? So fermentation, how would the use of the network be changed? So this is very similar to the analogy um, of the roadmap. So we basically are able, through the simulations and the methods I will describe you in a second, to investigate what are the functional states that my network can take on given some environmental conditions, for example, the availability of oxygen or not, or, for example, of having a bottleneck, a knockout, a deletion in a particular reaction in the TCA cycle or in the glycolysis, which is similar to, for example, a traffic jam or construction site. Yes. So this is, um, again, due to the steady state assumption. So we can, what we can um, put in as parameters is, for example, the maximum rate, the Vmax, that an enzyme can obtain or achieve. But we cannot put in as variables right now the concentration of an enzyme. 
is an advantage as well, I mean, because in most conditions you don't neither know the uh, K-cut nor the concentration of an enzyme, but you may have measured the overall uh, abundance. Yes, so that's, um, we're focusing here the method right now on metabolism. So regulation is not captured. We do have the production of a reactive oxygen species in there. And again, the, an, um, the cost, if you want, the metabolic cost associated with removing them, but not the damaging effect. No, we don't account for that. Okay, so the method that is um, that we use, the constraint-based reconstruction and analysis method that we use, um, is based on a dual causation. So the idea is that the living systems obey physical chemical laws so that there are some bounds, for example, um, an enzyme, um, well, an enzyme may operate um, with a particular Vmax or it's effectively catalyzing only an irreversible forward reaction as well as balances, that is a balance of mass, the balance of energy, etc and also that systems obey a genetic program. So you have, of course, um, alternatives in the po um, population, uh, population, and um, there may also be some underlying optimization principles or purposes. This can be debated, and I um, elucidate that later. So what we do is basically we go and take the genome annotation we take biochemical data, we generate the reaction list, we generate the matrix format, and then we um, invest use experimental data, literature, etc., and try to identify what are known um, features of the network or known conditions that my model should be able to grow in. And so, for example, if I know my maximum uptake rate of glucose can only be 18 units, then I can use this as a bound to the network or a constraint, okay? So I can, for example, set the maximum uptake rate and a minimum uptake rate of um, glucose to a particular value or a range. Similarly, I can s tell my model oxygen is available or not. So this is by manipulating the bounds. And we do that for the information that we have available. Um, let it be uh, physical chemical information, the loss of thermodynamics, or experimental data. And then the idea is um, of this method, um, along the um, quote of Sherlock Holmes is, how often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. So this is the main philosophy of the modeling constraint-based reconstruction and analysis um, method. So that we try to eliminate everything we know um, that cannot happen physiologically seen, thermodynamically seen, biologically seen, and investigate then what's remained. Um, the idea here is um, demonstrated. So if you have complete knowledge you have all the kinetic variables, all the enzyme concentrations, all the starting concentration of your um, metabolites, you will be able to solve the same matrix and system of equation that I showed you at the beginning, such that a single point, a single solution remains, okay? So you can determine which flux every single of the reactions and enzymes of the n in the network carries out. Unfortunately, we do not have those data available even for in vitro setups. So our knowledge is incomplete, hence we have incomplete constraints. And so we are not able to um, fall into the single point solution, but rather we have a space which contains all feasible solutions. And again, um, by applying bounces and balances, we remove parts of this so-called solution space that we think is improbable. And whatever remains is what we're going to analyze, and I will show you how we can use that. So here, again, the same idea. You have a network that you obtain, you convert that into a, mat a stoichiometric matrix. And this gives rise in such a steady-state solution space. Now, this um, stoichiometric matrix does represent your metabolic network of a particular um, target organism, but it also um, represents 
the mass balances of each of these um, metabolite along the way. So it's like in a kinetic model accounting for all the reactions not to produce or to remove a particular uh, metabolite um, from the system. So for example, um, the ADT would be then um, changed by V1, V2, uh, sorry, V3 and V5, let it be. And um, since they are all removing it, since we are assuming steady state, the um, concentration change for metabolite A is zero. So this is a linear equation, okay? And this linear equation is nothing else than what you may remember from your seventh grade mathematics class where you had a system of linear equations, x plus y equals five, three x plus y equals four, and you had to solve the system of equations such that you get a value for x and y. And you may remember that if you had less equations than variables, you could not solve uniquely for them. Okay. So that means you get dependencies, for example, um, 3x equals y. And only if you would have a value for y, you could also solve for x. And the same um, dependencies between these variables is shown here. But if you had, for example, um, the information that x has to be always greater or equal to zero, so it can't get negative, then if 3x equal y, you would know that y has to be positive as well and cannot be negative. So this is a constraint, but also an additional equation, linear equation to the system. And so that are the constraints that we're trying to apply a mathematically expressed the steady state assumption is um, described here and um, the constraints are or bounds are described as such. So what we're trying to solve in our method is give me given the stoichiometric matrix of a particular organism derived from the genome sequence and available biological data, um, identify a flux distribution describing each flux through each um, biochemical reaction in this matrix such that the solution is zero, subject to some bounds on these um, fluxes. So at the end, the steady state flux solution space contains all possible solutions that are consistent with these two equations. And I believe I may have some more equations, but um, there are very few equations in my slides, but those ones are um, one of the most important ones. Now, investigating the solution space comprehensively gets um, very difficult in um, the larger sizes of the network. So an average metabolic reconstruction for a microbe is about 1,000 reactions and the same number of metabolites, so 1,000 times 1,000. So the solution space is a high dimensional space and um, often contains um, an infinite, or it doesn't contain an infinite number of um, possible solutions. So there are different methods that have been developed by the field um, to interrogate this remaining solution space. And one of the ideas um, flux balance analysis is relying on is that um, we are interested in those solutions that follow a particular objective. Okay, so um, let's assume that I want my cell, and that's why metabolic engineering is so interesting, I want my cell to uh, produce a particular byproduct which is um, s um, created through this reaction V1. So I want to have all the solutions that give me maximum amount of this byproduct. And you would find this point here. And so the flux vector in this particular case, it's a single solution. The flux vector describing this um, point is then my s solution to this problem. Okay, so I state an objective here: the production of a particular byproduct to give get one of the possible solutions in the steady state phase. Um, now there are different objective functions, and one may actually argue: what is the objective of a given organism or a given cell? Um, physi physiologically meaningful, you could think about that a cell might be interested in maximizing energy or the redox potential, or you want to ma or the cell might or the organism might to want to maximize growth. Could be a fair enough assumption for a pathogen trying to overgrow um, other bacteria to dominate in the host. 
um, the storage of rare elements, for example, bioplastics, etc., um, which is uh, mean to store energy, minimize the uh, reactive oxygen production, etc., and there are many more um, that are listed there. So, a big question in our field is what is the objective function, particularly when you go to uh, human cells? What is the objective of a hepatocyte? I don't know. Is it uh, maximizing growth? Probably not. Is that maximizing um, energy uh, generation? Maybe in parts, but not alone. Um, so in those kinds of cases, the definition of an objective function becomes very difficult. It has been shown that uh, for bioengineering purposes, as well as for uh, um, growth of bacteria in the laboratory setting, this is actually quite um, a good assumption, particularly the uh, maximizing growth, because you can set up your experiments in the laboratory such that you can actually um, selectively or select for the fastest growing organism, thereby making the experiments consistent with your modeling. That is the maximization of growth. And there it's been shown that this um, computational model is actually quite, modeling approach is quite insightful. So um, bioengineering has a lot of examples. The only um, for production of um, byproducts. The only cell that I could think of, um, well, one of the um, cells that one could think of in the human body that may actually maximize growth um, are cancer cells. One could argue there this assumption may work. Um, but a lot of um, math methods that we have in the field rely on the formulation of such objective function. So how does it work? And this is now in a few slides trying to explain you the mathematics um, behind um, the method we're using. So remember I had shown you the um, polyhydron of the um, the steady state solution space. So the reason why we can use, um, oops, sir. now this is jumping by itself. Uh, we can use um, very tractable methods is because um, by the um, through the statement of the objective function, and this is then nothing else than um, trying to find, for example, a weighted path through the network. And there are linear programming algorithms that permit to solve those um, network flow um, problems um, very efficiently. And here it's important that this is a convex polyhydron. Um, convex means that from each point in the solution space, I can see any other, um, every other point. So um, every point is basically visible and I never will exit the solution space by um, when trajecting from one point to another. This is important for the realization that there are no local minimars for this um, algorithm, and hence they're always guaranteed to converge to the single global um, optima that is present. And this makes these um, algorithms fast and tractable. Uh, linear programming has been developed um, in um, during the Second World War by Danzig. It was a simplex algorithm, and um, I do believe I have a slide on it on how it works. Um, and since then, it's been used in many different areas of daily life, airline scheduling. There we solve a million of parameters and equations, um, allocating of the scheduling um, of conferences, the um, hotel room allocation, etc. All that is done th using uh, linear programming. So it's a very um, widely used approach and um, in this way also for biology. So the objective function is stated um, here code Z. Um, we have again our flux distribution in the network and we have some C that tells us um, if a particular uh, reaction is part of a uh, the objective function or not. The important part here is to realize that an objective function is always a linear combination of the reactions in the network. So it's linear. It's as soon as you go non-linear, um, the mathematics get more complex and you may not be able to use linear programming anymore. We minimize here, but this is a defini definition of the parameter, so you can minimize or up maximize an objective function. So um, 
the idea here is, for example, for the growth state that given my metabolic network, S dot V equals zero, this is a steady state assumption, and some bounds on my V, um, find me an objective reaction that um, permits to produce a maximum number of protein or um, biomass precursors. So we define that with our objective function. We can actually weight this accordingly. So now again, here you have the solution space, and we basically try to find a solution uh, sorry, along this way that maximizes a particular um, objective function. Um, we choose that. Let's see. And um, in this particular example up here, oh yeah, here's a um, toy network shown, very simple. You have a network going an in influx into the um, system. You have one reaction um, up here, one reaction here. Let me see, did I have? No. Um, up here, and then you maximize for the secretion of this particular byproduct. And you have basically two optimal or two possible paths through the network. And by optimization, um, you find the upper paths to be chosen as one of the functional states. Um, this is another term we're using a lot, the functional state through the network. So this is one way um, to go through the network and might be or is the optimal one. So flex balance analysis um, can be defined as um, the use of linear programming to solve the equation S dot V equals zero given some um, upper and lower bounds or constraints on V and a linear combination of fluxes as an objective. Okay, So a linear programming problem always relies on the definition of an objective. The output of FBA is a particular flux distribution V which maximizes or minimizes the objective function and basically contains in its values a flux value for each of the reactions in the network. So for each of the links in your LA map, you would now have a value associated, for example, how much traffic is going through. Okay. Um, okay. Let us assume we have um, a very simple network. Um, our um, for example, the equation here, V1 plus V2 equals um, V1. We know that V1 has to be greater than 0 and V2 has to be greater than 0, so you see these two um, um, fluxes here and you define your um, maximization problem, for example, as saying find me the maximum number, uh, maximum value for V1 and this one would be this particular point here. V1 would be maxima if all the flux go through this particular reaction and no flux go through V2. Okay. Similarly, um, V2 would be maximally if um, there's no flux, so if V1 is zero and V2 is um, non-zero. But you could choose any of the um, other objective functions. For example, you could maximize V1 plus V2, then your objective would go along this way and this entire line would correspond to your um, objective problem or your objective value. There are um, when doing um, flex variability, uh, flex balance analysis, you can find that de depending on the problem, linear programming problem that you state, you may have a unique solution. Like for example, in this case where I have um, want to maximize V1, there's a unique point that um, is consistent, only one single point and flux distribution gives rise to um, this particular value similar to V2. It could be also a generative solution where uh, there's an infinite number of um, points along an edge as shown here and every single of these points and the flux distribution or flux vectors pointing towards these points are possible solutions to this problem. Okay, so there are alternative um, pathways through the network giving you the same objective value and that occurs in, men in most of the simulations we're carrying out and then you can have an unbounded solution so that you have no maximum possible value defined. Here's a solution of um, an alternate optimal solution or equivalent solution shown on the 
um, left hand side this particular distribution through the network gives rise to the same objective value as this distribution for the network. So it's the same problem, the same constraint set, but two different ways, completely different ways of utilizing the network. And this is also an example of where additional information, additional constraints and parameters are needed to elucidate if one or the other is valid. And there are different techniques now available aye, to um, look at those kinds of alternative solutions. Uh, sorry for you. the slides are jumping. Um, so the flex balance ver um, analysis is basically again maximizing one single point in the solution space. Um, the flex variability analysis lets you elucidate are there alternative optimal solutions, are there different network configurations that permit you to give you the same um, optimal solutions and you can systematically elucidate those ones. And this is a very fast uh, method that we use a lot to get a feel for the network capability. So for example, what you can say is, well, um, given this particular objective function uh, here, I maximize and then I ask how flexible is my network, the remainder of the network to achieve that objective. Um, again, a metabolic engineering example, I want my E. coli to produce succinate maximally. So I compute with my model, I could generate, let's say, five units of um, succinate um, optimally. I can fix this particular value and then ask, well, how many, I t well, not how many, but how flexible is a network? Where could I put further tweaks into it to further guide um, the um, the um, use of the network and avoid maybe the production of unwanted byproducts. So this uh, flexibility analysis gives you a good insight into that. And then um, another tool that we use a lot is the gene deletion analysis. Again, keep remember that I told you about the gene reaction protein associations at the beginning. This is nothing else than just saying a particular reaction or a set of reactions in the network is not cannot carry any flex anymore, so the constraints are zero. Hence, I shop my steady state solution space. So I have a smaller solution space and I can ask the question, using FBA is, for example, growth affected. So does a mutant grow equally fast as um, my Y type, given some um, conditions? The field has developed over the last um, 15 years or so a myriad of methods I believe there are over 100 different methods available now to interrogate those metabolic networks for microbes, for um, human um, cells, and uh, many of them are based on FBA, so everything based on flex balance analysis um, goes off this branch here. And these methods have been driven, and their development have been driven by biological questions, bioengineering questions, bio medical questions, etc., and the field is continuing to grow. And I think the reason why um, this is such a prominent um, method is because we do not need all the parameters solved. Remember, we try to eliminate everything we kn um, know cannot occur. So knowing that something is not expressed or not present is equally important for us as knowing that something is there. And it's very forgiving for not having exact kinetic values. So if we have them available, we can incorporate them. If we don't have them, we can um, try to understand what are the remaining possible solutions in the solution space and um, ask between two different conditions, for example, aerobic growth versus anaerobic growth, what is different? How is the network differently used? What are the different functional states that one can um, achieve? There's um, a lot of software developed um, in the field. The Cobra Toolbox has encoded many of these uh, methods that I showed you beforehand in the um, phylogenetic tree. This is MATLAB encoded. There's also by now a Python and an R-based um, toolbox available, more or less comprehensive. So there are many uh, tools available, there are ma many methods available. Now I have to admit I started with a boring part because I kind of explained to you 
what we are doing, what is the basis of the method. So now the next um, set of slides, I want to convince you that one can do really cool stuff with that um, and try to um, contribute to the system's biomedicine by using this modeling technique. It is still on its start, um, well, it's still in its beginning. It's not as elaborated as the methods available for uh, metabolic engineering and a lot of questions haven't been answered, but I think there's great potential. So using this constraint-based reconstruction and analysis method, we can now go from pathways to networks. So instead of investigating small uh, reaction systems or subnetworks, using mathematical models, you can actually go on a large scale. So this is shown for um, the human metabolic network that we have, shown are about 5,000 reactions of by now 9,000 reactions that we capture in the model. And so we can ask, well, what happens if you have a bottleneck somewhere? Again, the same as in the roadmap. What happens if you have hypoxic conditions versus non-moxic conditions? You, of course, know that a network that human cells or the human body do not operate in isolation so we can of course provide nutrients to them or to the cells um, and we can um, ask for particular outputs that may be um, the growth itself or it could be the storage of um, fat or the generation of um, energy that drive other physiological um, um, processes. So for us it is uh, one of the interests as a group is um, to use as a test case for the development of the models and the methods the inborn errors of metabolism. Inborn errors of metabolism are individually rare but um, com um, collectively very common. So one out of um, 800 live birds carries a deficiency in single gene deficiency in the metabolic part of the um, genome encoded or protein encoding genes. So that's quite frequent. But um, keep in mind, some of these uh, rare diseases individually, there are only two, three, four cases reported worldwide that have a particular deficiency. So for these individuals, it's very difficult to get um, access to therapies or even understanding about the disease mechanism because uh, little data is available. More than 500 um, IEMs have been reported. In fact, the doctor once told me that there are um, as many inborn errors of metabolism as there are metabolic enzymes. It's just about being you know, um, discovered on one hand, and of course many of them are maybe also lethal, so you will never um, observe those um, single gene deletions. And they affect literally um, all areas of metabolism that is central metabolism, amino acid metabolism, etc. Interestingly enough, um, they have variable presentations. So they can be mild to severe, um, septic to word. And that becomes very interesting also in the light of complex diseases. You have modulators in the genome that may actually modulate the intensity and the, the severeness of the disease, um, either through gain or loss of function. Um, worldwide, there have been newborn screening programs um, generated, and I think I have that in one of the later slides, um, where basically um, newborns are tested with a peak in the heel um, and mass spectrometry analysis for known biomarkers and known um, disturbances in those biomarkers for the most common um, metabolic diseases. They're generally single gene defects and they affect biochemical um, enzymes or also transporters. And I uh, can be characterized by the accumulation of substrates or the deficiency of products or the inhibition of secondary um, compounds. And so this is a CAC map, um, an earlier version, where we actually sh um, highlight known metabolic um, deficiencies and their biomarkers across the map. Just to illustrate again, it affects entire metabolism. Um, the newborn screening is done uh, routinely, I think, uh, for babies between 24 hours to 74 hours after birth. It's um, just a little peak on the heel, a little squeezing. Then you have these um, little cards where you put in um, 
the blood spots and they are dried and they will be afterwards um, analyzed using mass spectrometry and um, then compared to known healthy ranges of um, those concentrations. So they are amino acids, organic acids and um, well, amino acids on the side carotines mostly that are measured and then you can scan for amino acid organic acid and fatty acid metabolic disorders for which diseases are scanned for and tested for depends on the countries and also as you can imagine um, the interlaboratory comparability is um, difficult however um, there have been uh, many um, positive aspects for that. There are a lot of nutritional interventions available for those um, or for some of the inborn errors of metabolism. PKU being one of those ones if detected early has almost no side effect for the infant um, by the restriction of certain substrates we taken up. Uh, more um, severe diseases may re require the replacement of enzymes um, gene therapy or even organ transplantation and then it becomes very difficult. But if treatable, many of the inborn errors of metabolism are treated through um, nutritional interventions, either supplementations or removal of uh, dietary components, which raises for us the questions, can we use this modeling technique plus um, the metabolic model for human that we have available to a first instant model known inborn errors of metabolism, then maybe predict also um, novel enzymapathies based on screening profiles. So where you have a deranged screening profile, but you cannot um, uniquely identify um, the underlying disease, and then also um, contribute to the discovery of more um, biomarkers, secondary biomarkers, and I believe one of the strengths of the method could also be to look into therapeutic strategies for some of these IEMs that are currently not well treated. Um, at this end, we created a compendium of uh, 330 um, inborn errors of metabolism going through the literature, mapping our human metabolic network and the data available both together, collected information about the genes um, which you got from the literature and the human metabolic reaction provided the reactions and pathways, but also information about the mode of inheritance, um, phenotypic and clinical features, and so on. And so this compendium can then be used as a starting point for um, querying, for example, or in our case also for the um, benchmarking of our human metabolic network. The first version of the Human Metabolic Network um, and the derived model has been published in 2007, um, that time out of the Posen Group in San Diego, and together with other resources about human metabolism that were available, the community came together and said, well, we want to have a unified picture of human metabolism um, and um, the resulting model and so they came together and worked all to generate a global well, a consensus reconstruction which globally represents the metabolic transformations known to occur in any of the human cell in the human body. So it is not a hepatocyte model, it's not a muscle model, but it really represents what we know to occur as biochemical transformations in the entire human model. Okay. Um, hence, we call it a global metabolic reconstruction. It captures 7,400 reactions and um, about 1,800 unique metabolic genes. So it's about 8% or so of the protein coding region. And you can access it through, th um, through this website. And um, the problem here is with the human metabolic network, as it does not represent a particular cell type, the question arises, well, how can I validate such a reconstruction? It's not only a knowledge base where we capture what's known, but also we want to use it for modeling purposes. But then we have to benchmark and validate it. But now suddenly there are no cell type specific data available that it would be consistent with. So uh, we decided to use these inborn errors of metabolism to um, benchmark and I um, yeah, determine the accuracy of this um, resulting or this reconstruction of the resulting models. So 
for the inborn errors of metabolism and we can find for the different diseases that people have uh, reported in clinical studies particular biomarkers. And here are shown amino acid deficiencies as well as amino acid biomarkers. And we compare and illustrate the predicted biomarkers with the measurements and see if this is an agreement or disagreement with uh, um, literature. And you see in shadings the predictions, blue is up, red is down, and then the lines is what is reported in the literature. And you can find overall we have a quite good overlap. So the model is able to um, capture quite accurately the changes of biomarkers uh, here shown for the amino acids upon single gene deletion in the network. So removing of one or more of these nodes uh, links in the network. And we also see that there are certain discrepancies. So those ones are very interesting because they again could hint us towards where the model is wrong currently. The other interesting part here is that actually we can predict many more biomarkers than they have been um, reported in the literature, which may allow us um, to think about more um, distinguishing, um, separating biomarkers to um, distinguish between very close diseases, like the tyrosinemia um, shown here. Overall, we achieved the accuracy of 77% and a reasonable p-value. So overall, we can now say the model is able to capture somewhat accurately the um, proposed biomarker changes up in single gene deletions on a whole body level. Sure. Um, the reason probably is, um, I think it's, well, downregulation could occur, for example, through inhibition. We don't have inhibition or we don't have regulation in there. We have also a, a lot of redundant pathways. Remember, this is many reactions that occur generally in different organs let's say muscles and a liver, and now in one model there's no separation between those ones. So I think that reduces the sensitivity of the model as well. And that's something to keep in mind. And really, um, the next step of improvement is to get higher sensitivity also for the down regulations. Yeah. So um, one of the disadvantages, not disadvantages, uh, but one of the things one needs to be aware of is there are a lot of parallel uh, alternative pathways um, in the network, there are different ways to go from one place to another or one metabolite to another in the network given the network topology. And of course we don't have the kinetic information and therefore many of the enzymes we don't know the Vmaxes. So there's also no preferentiation. One pathway is preferred in, let's say, um, normoxic conditions versus the other one is more utilized under uh, hypoxic conditions or, for example, um, certain um, different um, K-cuts that are um, developmental stage dependent, all these information we don't capture. And that may um, be a reason for the low, well, the reasonable but not very high accuracy of the network. So there's uh, definitely room and for improvement for having more constraints and more information available. Uh, similarly for the genes, many of the genes have um, isoforms and isozymes. So those ones also um, reduce the sensitivity of the network, which would be normally either um, separated by time, that is in different developmental stages, or in different organs in the body, and thereby compartmentalized. So one of the things we then did is to um, start from this human metabolic reconstruction and focus on enterocyte metabolism. Again, going back to our interest of like understanding what is the contribution of diet and health to so the small intestinal enterocytes are the place where nutrients are taken up by the human body. And so we were interested in um, getting a more specific metabolic reconstruction for the enterocytes that we can then use to investigate under different um, dietary conditions and how the metabolism would be changing. Now, 
The um, enterocytes are the most popular cell types in the small intestine and they account for the majority of the enzymatic digestion and nutrient absorption. And they're metabolically very active. Actually, they're second to the liver cells and have, yeah, so they're second to the liver cells. And so this network was assembled um, based on literature only. There's no, at the time there was no omics data available, so no transcriptomic data and proteomic data. Hence, the network is relatively small compared to the overall global network, which had 7,000 reactions. And also the number of genes is relatively small. It's about a third. We defined 50 objective functions or metabolic tasks. Because what is the task that a, what is the objective of a small intestinal cell? We don't know. We know growth can't be it because actually they can't divide. They're replaced every five, ti um, every five days approximately through stem cells that are in the, um, on the bottom of the villies along the, um, so basically they get replaced. So they maybe maintain themselves for five days, which is not very long, but they definitely don't grow. So we defi decided um, to define transport reactions, um, certain metabolic pathways that are known to occur in enterocyte uh, metabol um, cells, enterocyte um, glucose metabolic reactions, cholesterol reactions, but also these uh, transport capabilities um, in those tasks and then we mapped also these inborn errors of metabolism to it. And even though we only have about a third of the genes um, compared to the um, global reconstruction, um, almost half of the inborn errors of metabolism mapped onto the smaller network. And more interestingly, the three quarters of those are actually having effect on at least one of these 50 tasks. So you could imagine that um, knockout or reduced activity of any of these um, 79 uh, metabolic, sorry, metabolic enzymes would actually cause a reduced activity and functionality of your small intestine and um, cells, which are the entrance points of your nutrients. So one of the um, inborn errors that my student at the time was very interested in is um, perforias that are um, deficiencies along all eight steps of the heme biosynthesis, which starts with this particular compound here and um, some heme precursor to then um, create um, the hemes that are needed, for example, in the um, complexes of the oxidative phosphorylation. And so perforias are defined um, as enzyme deficiencies along those ways, and they're known that um, while those cells cannot convert um, perforins into heme, since they have a block, and they are characterized, or individuals with uh, perforias are characterized with uh, cutaneous sensitivities, gastrointestinal disturbances, and neurological manifestations. And so if we did now these knockouts, in the model, in the small intestine in the model, and ask well, which of these 50 metabolic functions or objective functions would be affected um, under here a average American diet, uh, we found that um, the urea cycle and synthesis flux was reduced and that there was no heme degradation. So the heme degradation, lack of heme degradation is interesting because um, of course, we can't produce heme, hence you can't, um, or you do have no need for the degradation of um, heme. Then we looked into the diet that we've obtained from the website, and it turns out that this diet formulation is heme-free. So everybody who eats red meat definitely has heme and has American diet, so this diet chart should include heme. Nevertheless, if you have no heme or um, less heme available in your diet, you will not have um, the degradation, hence no bilirubin um, excretion and um, a reduced um, CO production. Now the interesting part here is that both uh, bilirubin um, and CO have protective um, function in the small intestine. So bilirubin exerts antioxidative um, activity and um, CO also has a, a protective role, and hence uh, may be indicating that indeed um, the availability of heme in the diet may actually be 
um, related to the gastrointestinal uh, um, inflammation that one observes in uh, porphyria patients. At the same time, we um, observed a reduced uh, Rugier cycle flux, and that would increase the amount of ammonium ion available circulating in the blood, and this could be linked to neurological manifestation. So these ones are hypotheses, but there are hypotheses generated from the network by just systematically analyzing the steady state solution space. So by simulating a particular diet, knocking out a single gene, I can then ask what are the solutions that are remaining in the solution space and how do they compare to the healthy individual, healthy model, um, under the same diet. And I can start to put biochemistry behind some of the clinical observations that people reported. Those ones are hypotheses. We are good in generating hypotheses and many of those. Um, they need experimental validation, of course. Another um, aspect that we're interested in is then to drive that the next step further to also not only um, consider the gastrointestinal tract from the host side, the human side, but also the microbes that are um, living in us. And uh, for that, we needed to expand our modeling framework um, to develop new methods, etc. And to be best able to do so, we decided to um, use a mouse reconstruction, sorry, a mouse reconstruction, and a particular uh, microbe that has been both been well studied. So the data for mice um, is more available, so we can actually test our modeling framework much better than going with the human metabolic network. So what we did is we took the human metabolic network, we mapped homologous genes, used some experimental data, and retrieved a humanized mouse model, um, I would say. And we combined this humanized mouse model with um, a commensal bacteria often found in the human um, gut, um, Bacteriodes zeta omicron, and we combined that um, in the following way. So we have defined, here's our mouse model, which is similar um, in the layout as a human metabolic network. We have an artificial compartment, the lumen, as you would find it on the gastrointestinal tract, and then we have the microbiome model. And we define um, the following scenario, well, we can represent the following scenario. We have a particular nutrient uptake, for example, the average American diet. These nutrients can be either taken up by the host, the mouse, through the um, encoded um, transporters, or by the bacteria, so they can, in principle, compete between these um, for the uptake of these nutrients. The host can produce glycans um, and bile acids and secrete them into the lumen, which then, in turn, can be taken up by uh, the microbe, which also can produce fermentation products, for example, short-chain fatty acids, which then can be taken up by the host. The, um, this scenario, the host has another compartment, which we call biofluids, um, which is basically in which, for example, um, the global network would secrete. And we can't distinguish between urine, CSF, and blood because we don't have organs captured in the, um, in the mouse model as well as in the human reconstruction. But you can start to predict what are the um, biofluid metabolon subject to the different microbes that you have available or the different diets. Now, to test this um, computational setup, um, we computed um, the growth relationship between the two of them in a qualitative manner. And if you focus on the blue line here, which corresponds to the uh, um, um, high carbon diet, you will see that the uh, mouse achieves about 50% of its maximally possible growth rate if, sorry, the bacteria um, achieves 50% of the maximum possible growth rate if no mouse is present or the mouse is not grown and uh, metabolically active. And this increases quite dramatically to its maximum at a particular um, growth rate of the host. Similarly, the host can grow by itself but um, profits a lot by the presence of a bacteroides yota, um, omicron, which is consistent with what we know. Germ-free mice um, can live, they grow, but they don't strive. As soon as you inoculate them with at least one bacteria, um, they strive because the bacteria help them to um, 
digest otherwise undigestible nutrient components. In this particular case, uh, um, a carbohydrate. So Bacteroides is specialized on um, fermenting complex carbohydrates. And so then, interestingly enough, there's a region between the two maximas where both microbes, uh, both microbes and the host, basically compete for the nutrients that are available. And um, if one looks into the different simulation results here, again, one can see that they are competing mostly for amino acids. Amino acids make sense from the diet because the mouse has essential amino acid and needs to retrieve them from the biome, uh, from the nutrients. If it can't, it can't grow fast. And for the microbe, it's cheaper to take up from the um, diet the amino acids and producing the building blocks itself. So by competing for these essential amino acids, but also some other compounds, um, we obtain this observed um, trade-off. So for us, this was kind of like an um, illustration that coarse grain, on a coarse grain view, we can capture what is what we know about um, host-microbe interaction. So we then um, went ahead and asked, well, if we delete um, each of the genes, 1400 genes captured by the mouse model individually on an average American diet, and asked, can my mouse still grow? Um, we found that th um, 50 of those um, knockouts actually resulted in a no growth phenotype. So 50 out of 1400 is not so many. Um, one of them was the UMP synthetase, which is an enzyme in the nucleotide metabolism. We repeated then the same exercise with uh, um, same mouse model, same knockout, but this time associated with a microbe as shown beforehand. So we had the same diet, everything is the same, except we have the microbe there. And there, interestingly, um, we observed in 29 of these 50 cases that the growth was restored. So the question is, what are the microbes doing to the host or providing the host with that allows them to restore the growth. And for the UMP synthetase, we looked into it a little bit deeper. In the solution, again, the answer of this question is lying in the modeling solutions. And we found that uridine supplement, or that probably the microbe is um, supplementing the host with uridine. So we tested this hypothesis in silico by just taking our average American diet, adding to it uridine, the same knockout, no bacteria, and indeed it could grow. So this was for us just a um, cross check that indeed one single compound was sufficient um, to um, restore the growth. So then the question is, well, how much does that matter? And so we went to the literature, and for us the luck is that this UMP synthetase is actually deficient, or uretic aciduria patients are deficient in this particular enzyme. And they have been um, characterized, and there are clinical reports available. And it turns out the standard treatment of these patients is uridine supplementation. So this is some information we hadn't provided to the model up front. So we retrieved it de novo from the modeling, but it is a standard treatment of these individuals. We had predicted um, three other um, nucleotides that could be um, also acting instead of uridine, one was cytidine. Um, cytidine is more expensive as a compound than uridine and has not been followed up further if it could be actually used as a um, supplement. And the other one was um, uracil. And uracil actually been shown to be ineffective in human as um, treating those um, individuals. And very recent publications showed that while mice have a functional uracil transporter in the small intestine, the human version is a pseudogene, explaining why these predictions are inconsistent. So it is a very small story, but it gives me some... Um, confidence that indeed this modeling approach could be used to bridge the diet, microbiota, health um, trajectory and actually provide further insight. Okay, let me see. What we did then next is to ask, well, the modeling approach that we, and framework that we developed can be extended to any number of microbes. And so we then ask, well, if there 
um, what are the available metabolic reconstructions for gut microbes and here um, a list of 11 or so shown and um, they are of commensal types, probiotic, pathogenic, etc. And we ask, well, is there any difference between those microbes and how they may affect um, the host? In this case, we use the human. And um, do they actually change those interactions as a function of diet? And here's an example shown. Again, we have the same modeling set up, just that we have a microbiota this time instead of a single microbe. And if we use a high-fat um, diet, which is rich in our case with linoic acid, we can observe that um, there's a higher flux on the body fluid secretion of a particular leukotriene, such as leukotriene A4, which is an immunometabolite. Similarly, we can observe that or predict that if you have uh, microbes like uh, Bacteriolocyte uta omicron, or Fecalibacterium protonici, that you have as, um, which may secrete cysteine, that this cysteine can be then metabolized to glutathione, which defines the uh, redox um, potential in the lumen as well as in the rest of the body. So this is increased if you have the secretion of cysteine. If you have both the high fat um, fat diet and particular microbes that can produce cysteine, um, available, then you actually get uh, cysteine near leukotrienes um, produced in a higher amount or a higher flux in the body fluid, and those um, compounds have been associated with increased risk of allergies. And um, there is very little information available in the literature, but um, there has been one study at least for leukotriene E4 where they reported that there's an increase of this uh, particular leukotriene in the um, plasma metabolome in um, traditional mice compared to germ-free mice. And you can bring that game a little bit further and just ask, well, systematically, what are the metabolites that would be affected by the presence or absence of one or more of these uh, microbes? And what are the microbial precursors that would lead to the increase in body fluid metabolome? And so you can see that uh, many of the amino acids, if produced by the microbiota, would lead um, to the production of many of the known uh, metabolites that have been associated with microbes. Serotonin is here, adrenaline is up here, dopamine. All those ones are known to be more modulated um, by the microbiota and um, captured correctly by the model. Interestingly enough, um, we predict in some cases very high um, full changes. It remains questionable and to which extent the microbes indeed want to produce so many amino acids. And this um, highlights as well um, the the aspect of the modeling we're doing. We right now investigate metabolic capabilities. We investigate what can a given microbiome and a diet and a host do in principle. It does not mean as is um, done um, as such all these compounds at once, but it's a metabolic potential. And one can start to compare what is happening if I have certain uh, microbes present or absent, or if I have certain deficiencies, how is my metabolic capability and potential changing? Um, so here's just um, highlighted what is known. So many of these compounds are known, many of these ones are hormones. It has been suggested by the literature that the gut actually the gut organ, the microbiome, serves as an endocrine um, organ and indeed um, the model would capture that as such. So taking together what I showed you over the last um, hour and a half or so is that when that the constraint-based modeling reconstruction and analysis approach is a very scalable approach. It, ta it is very fast to compute. Going back to the human metabolic network with 7,000 reactions or so, if I do a single le gene deletion and I ask, can I produce a particular biomarker, the simulation takes about a fraction of a second, so it's really fast. So you can ask many of these questions um, in a very short time. Um, it's a very promising approach 
to actually investigate cell 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 microbe interactions because it is so scalable. You can represent the microbes or the microbiome on a metabolically accurate level, on an organ specific level, um, organism specific level, as well as the human at the same time, and solve still in a reasonable time the mathematical models that you generate. Um, we do have the shortcoming of the steady state assumption. And that means we cannot tell you something about the concentrations that are needed, the abundances of the microbes, how much of a particular metabolite in the plasma will be produced, or how fast will be a nutrient digested. Those are questions that are very much tailored towards um, more comprehensive modeling techniques. But what we can tell you is if a particular nutrient added or removed would have an effect on the host or on the microbiota. So it's a capability question. And one thing you can do, and I believe where the strength really lies here, is that one can ask these um, time independent, concentration independent questions about capability first on this level of questions. Once one has identified key components that contribute, Again, remember the sh um, picture and the slide with the diet and the microbes that produce the leukotrienes. One can use more comprehensive, detailed modeling techniques on a smaller scale and to then investigate um, concentrations, threshold, and time. So I think it is one step towards further understanding what's happening. As this modeling technique um, provides blueprints for the human metabolic net or human metabolism as defined by the human genome as well as microbiome um, models, one can actually start thinking about personalized modeling. If you had state variables describing, for example, your genome and your functional uh, states through, for example, metabolites, one could generate metabolic models of the host and the microbes for an individual at a particular time point. Again, we cannot predict trajectories, but for each time point, uh, person has been analyzed, we can generate a metabolic network and we can ask questions, well, how is my network changing over the time course? How am I changing over the lifespan and how are certain infections potentially affecting me? So by doing this um, comparative analysis and with the data that is available, this method may contribute on this level. And I do believe um, that one can look into the nutrient supplementation, maybe um, dietary adjustment um, aspect of it, and thereby helping to remain healthy rather than de to cure diseases. So one question one could imagine to do as with these modelings, if I really had my, um, my body, my metabolism characterized today in a month and in a few months time, and I could ask, well, if I'm going with few variables out of the healthy window where it's defined to be healthy, what could I do and how could I adjust very targetly and very specifically for myself, my diet, such that I remain close to the healthy window and avoid to actually get to a um, pathogenic state. And with that, I click over the last few slides. I uh, have this um, obligatory thanks slide for uh, the people that actually did the work. Um, Almut, Stefania, Dimitri, Svagatika and um, the rest of the team. And yeah, thanks for the attention and <laughs> questions, I guess.